We're building a computer from absolute scratch. This forces us to use unfamiliar numbers. The only system of numbers computers understand. Binary. It's very unintuitive and hard to read. Bro, how on earth is this 11? I want to find a way to convert these binary numbers to human readable numbers, just to make it easier to follow the flow of data. What we have to do is break this number down into its digits and show each of the digits on these number displays. This is actually surprisingly difficult for a computer to do, since the information about the digits is hidden away by the way we write binary numbers. Numbers. We know that this represents 8, this is 2, and this is 1. Adding 8 plus 2 plus 1 gives us 11. The problem is, if we add 8, 2, and 1 in binary, we've walked in a circle and just end up back at 1011 again. We're not converting, we're just adding. So how do we actually do this? One solution we'll come across multiple times is the double dabble algorithm. I honestly don't understand how this works, and because the point of the series is to demystify everything, we'll have to come up with something else. Luckily, there's a better way to break the number down into its digits. Division. But of course, division is notoriously difficult to design a circuit for. Can a nigga live? Can a nigga live please okay listen it might be challenging but here's why it's worth it when you divide a number by 10 it naturally breaks the number down with the remainder being the last digit and it doesn't matter how big the number is you can just keep dividing by 10 and the remainders you get are the digits of that number in order and math is math so following the same steps in binary will give us the same answer this is how i was taught division minus the whooping of course 4569 divided by 10 how many tens fit into four that's zero. How many tens fit into 45? That's four. Four times 10 is 40, and 45 minus 40 is five. Bring down the six and repeat these steps. And at the end, your remainder is the last digit, and the answer holds the rest of the digits. So we need a circuit that checks how many times 10 goes into a number, then a circuit that multiplies by 10, then a circuit that subtracts, and we're starting to see why it's so difficult to design a division circuit. There's just so much circuitry we'll need to add. So let's try to strip away all this unnecessary circuitry. We will always divide by 10, and that means our circuit can be more specialized and especially designed for division by 10. This simplifies the circuit we'll have to build because it doesn't have to be as generalized as a circuit that can divide by any number. Also, say for example we're dividing 4569 by 300. Notice that 300 can never fit into one or two digits. We know it won't fit. We only need to start checking on the third digit. The same applies in binary. 1010 can never fit in three bits, so we can start checking on the fourth bit. For our first step, how many tens fit into a number? In binary, the answer can only ever be 0 or 1. This is because the greatest 4-bit number we can have is 15, and only one ten can fit into 15, and the smallest 4-bit number is 0, and 0 tens can fit into 0. So all we have to do is check if the number is greater than 10. If it is, then we output a 1. We're only ever checking 4 bits, so we can actually write out all the possible combinations. I know it looks dumb and tedious, but trust me, we still good. We want to make a circuit that checks if a number is greater than 10. That's these numbers right here. So I'll put a 1 on those outputs, and zeros on the rest. It outputs a 0 if the highest bit, a 4, is not a 1, or if a 3 is not a 1, and a 2 is not a 1. An AND gate with two NOT gates at its inputs is just equivalent to a NOR gate. So this is the completed circuit. Now for the remainders. We don't need a dedicated subtraction circuit here. We know what the remainder will be when the number is 15 for example. So we can just write this out too. If we have a 1 on the division input, we have 1 as the remainder. Same goes for the rest of the units. This only changes when we go greater than 10. At 10, the remainder is 0. At 11, it's 1. At 12, it's 2. And so on. If you've never seen Digital Logic before, I recommend you watch my last video about ALU design. I show how we go from truth tables to circuits, which is a powerful concept worth learning. Well, this is a much larger truth table than the one we designed for in the last video, but the idea stays the exact same. We can split the remainder bits and tackle them individually. And having a look at our truth table, R1 looks like the easiest to start with. Let's try and find some patterns here. Notice how R1 is always a copy of A1, so no circuitry needed. You can just send that straight to the output. That was easy. Let's look for other patterns. R4 is a zero if A4 is not A1 or the number is greater than 10. For R4 to be a one, we just have to invert the final result. Two down, two to go. Now there's an interesting pattern here on R2. Notice how it just copies A2 here. But that pattern changes if the number is greater than 10. It now becomes the opposite of A2. 
We need a circuit that allows our input to pass through, but can invert the input when we tell it to. This is the exact same idea we used for the B input in the ALU video. We can use an XOR gate for this. So it copies A2 if the number is less than 10, but if it's greater than or equal to 10, then it should invert A2. So we need our XOR gate, A2 as our input, and we want the greater than signal to act as our negate input. This is turning out to be quite easy, isn't it? We're almost done. Now, R3 is a bit of a problem, but nothing unsolvable. As always, we target the zeros. R3 is a zero if A3 is not a one, or A4 is a one, and A2 is not a one. Just invert the final result for the ones, and that's the circuit we need for our job. Now, this circuit as a whole breaks down a four bit number into two digits. For example, 13 is one and three. You can use the same concept to expand this to as many bits as you'd like, but 4 bits is good enough for now. Let's turn these digits into actual numbers on these displays. That means it's time for PCB design. My favorite part of PCB design is changing up the colors and seeing what beautiful combinations I can come up with. Unfortunately, some of the colors are locked away at higher prices. This limits how wacky I can get with it. PCBWay has decided to break these shackles and is allowing us to experiment with new colors like this gorgeous purple solder mask for free. And for my 3D printing enthusiasts, they're offering discounts on TPU prints. This is only in September, so start ordering before the end of the month. Now, not only does this circuit handle our first issue, it looks stylish while doing so. Thank you to PCBWA for sponsoring this video and giving us more creative freedom. Now back to our problem. We still have to wire up the second board, and we already know it's gonna be way more difficult. Even designing a logic circuit for this is challenging. Okay, since the upper digit will only ever show a one or be completely off, then it's actually really easy to get this first number up. For my display to turn on, which may be a little different from yours depending on where you bought it, I need to add a resistor from 5 volts to the middle pin and connect the segment I want to light up to ground. So to show a 1, we want this segment and this segment on. So I'll just connect those together and I'll hide the wiring under the display. And this works perfectly. Whenever the number is greater than 10, we want this to show a 1. Now for the second digit. This is much harder to do because there are more numbers to worry about. But again, work one step at a time. We're going to have to draw up the numbers on paper. And I've gone with a 7 that looks like this and a 9 that looks like this because it makes the logic easier to design. I won't go over all the 7 segments because I feel like I'm just repeating the same stuff now. But to illustrate the points, let's do the F segment. Notice that the F segment is always on if the number is even. It's a weird coincidence, but how do we know if a binary number is even? Let's check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. That's enough to give us a clear pattern. Notice that all the even numbers always have a 0 at the lowest bit, and that will never change. So a number is even if its last bit is a 0. So we invert that to get the even signal. Now I lied, not all the even numbers turn the F segment on. It's off for four. So what we have to do is check if the number is four and it's only four if this, this, and this are all zeros and this is a one. So if it's even and it's not four, then F should be on. Again, we can make another transistor saving simplification here. Since the numbers are only ever zero to nine, then to check for 4, this upper bit doesn't have to be strictly 0 because we'll never get to 12, which is the other case that would unwantedly activate F. Now that works for F, and this works for the rest of them. Now watch me hand-wire the circuit on breadboards. Never mind, I lost the footage somehow. Just enjoy the end result. So this is the completed circuit. I know I should have used the PCB budget more wisely, but hey, it works. It converts a binary number presented down here to a decimal number presented down here. So cycling through, we have 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Hey, the video's not ten minutes yet, so uh, enjoy some chess, I guess. And we get paired up with a guy from Bolivia. Just gonna play for the Stonewall setup here. Yes, we play the same setup every game. I don't like studying. Just gonna jump in here, castle. This guy's trying to cheese me already. Is this what they do in Bolivia? Let's hit the bishop here. He takes. Mm, I don't want to give him the dark squares. Might have to take the bishop. It's not about the material. Don't worry about the material. It's about the activity. Okay, I want to centralize here, but I don't want him to trade yet. Might just have to pass the move back to him. He wants the castle. We'll meet you there, bitch. He takes, takes, Let's bring the bishop back. 
I was trying to set him up there. Oh, and he just blundered his knight, I guess. Take six, that's mine. Oh, free tempo. We'll take that. F4. Bishop F5 here, just lining up some tactics with the queen. Hits the queen here. Might be in a bit of trouble. We jump in. He can't take that. He gets mated. I mean, listen. You're playing against me, honestly. You should expect these bombastic moves. These deadly moves. Takes, takes. Just trading everything off here. Centralize the queen. Oh, and I just blunder my bishop. You know, it's so unfortunate. Because I just play a move like knight to f6. <sighs> and, uh, yeah. Next move, I just blunder my bishop for no reason. Just trying to stay alive at this point, honestly. This Bolivian guy is just trying to flag me. This Bolivian guy is really sneaky, isn't he? Is this what they do in Bolivia? Now I hate Bolivia. Just because of this guy. Ooh. Oh, I could have had him honestly. I should not have lost that game. Hey, rest in peace my nigga Charlie Kirk, man. They just gonna dome my nigga in public like that? You know how crazy it is for you to just be able to Google your dad's death? Especially when they grow older, you know, the morbid curiosity gets to them. Oh man, my heart breaks for him honestly. And my nigga Trump does not care, you saw? <laughs> Trump does not care at all. I mean, honestly, if you think about how they're handling it after the death, it's kind of weird. Two days after the doming, she's out here making speeches, giving speeches in public. Man, they're, they're using fireworks at this guy's funeral, and they immediately make it a left versus right thing, you know? Same time, NASA releases this alien stuff. Listen, I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but man, this might be a ploy to cover up the files, you know what I'm saying? But I, uh, yeah, you can skedaddle now.